as stated earlier, Mr. Ramos is unable to attend today. Okay, would you all please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you. The first item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes of the April 16th, 2015 board meeting. Um, are there any additions or corrections to the minutes? Move approval. It's been moved, and I second. It's been moved and seconded to uh, approve the minutes of the April 16th, 2015 board meeting. Okay, the next item is public comment. Um, this is the opportunity for the co public to comment on items that are not on the agenda. If you would like to make a public comment, I would like to invite you to come forward and state your name, please, for the record. Um, I am Barbara Sang. Ms. Sang, you, you are an agendized item on the agenda. Uh, and this is not um, about that. Okay. okay. But it is about um, whistleblowing and ethical behavior, but it's not directly you know, about It's really hard to hear you. You might want oh, to speak up certainly. a little bit there. Okay. It's not, um, it doesn't have a direct bearing on, well, it's not about my claim, but it is about whistleblowing and ethical behavior. And I did write something um, so it could go more efficiently and effectively. As I said, I am Barbara Sang. I am a former state employee who earned multiple awards, including the Superior Accomplishment Award. I am a whistleblower. I became a whistleblower as a result of what I was seeing and experiencing in the state agency I worked in. I know personally of other whistleblowers, including the extraordinary Carol Arbuckle, and I know of other whistleblowers, such as former state lawyer Kathleen Carroll. We suffered. The reality is that it is not safe to whistleblow. Laws and policies do not protect when those who are responsible for upholding laws and policies choose to violate them or to condone violations occurring. I feel the public has grown used to reading scandal after scandal in the Sacramento Bee about what has wrongly occurred in some state agencies. Harm can remain undercover for a long time before it is exposed on the outside. Sacramento Bee journalist John Ortiz this month wrote about the two Cal Fire employees who had cheated to get a state job, and Mr. Re Ortiz reported that they were recently promoted. He made the significant point that management had to have supported the promotion. I cannot comprehend that there, there being any kind of support for unethical behavior. It does not make good business sense. I think that even the appearance of tolerating unethical behavior is risky, too. During the later talk of my claim, I will be speaking of the enormity of the unlawful and unethical conduct in CDPH. I believe lawsuits do not affect the critically needed changes. I wish now to urge that ethical and law-abiding behavior be demanded in every state agency. And I wish to recommend that when an executive in a state agency has even one incident of unlawful, unethical behavior that the executive should be terminated and never hired back into the state system. A healthy business culture must be actively nurtured and great care needs to be taken when the culture is put at risk by unlawful and unethical behavior occurring. State agencies have a duty to the people of California. That duty must be honored at all times. Violations can even put lives at risk. Please consider the significance of those 11,000 complaints regarding abuse or neglect in nursing homes that CDPH failed to investigate timely. Sacramento Bee journalist Margie Lundstrom made so much so clear in her series of articles last year. All of those vulnerable human beings. Everything is a part of the puzzle, and that puzzle is becoming very costly. It is critical that it becomes safe to whistleblow. Human life is precious. Thank you very much for your comment. Appreciate it. Are there any other members of the public that would like to make a comment today? Okay, seeing none. Um, we'll now move to item number three, which is the executive officer statement. 
Julie. Thank you. Good morning, members. I'm just uh, real briefly kind of recapping that uh, last month uh, was California Crime Victims' Rights Month, and we had um, several events to uh, bring attention to that, including our digital town hall, um, our own visit to the Family Justice Center in Alameda County, and spending time with um, District Attorney Nancy O'Malley, and then I had the pleasure of uh, being with Board Member Ramos at uh, the event he held in San Bernardino County, um, again, observing National Crime Victims' Rights Week and all the incredible work that's being done in San Bernardino County. Um, April is also Sexual Assault Awareness Month, and we participated um, actively in that by uh, co-sponsoring the screening of a documentary called The Hunting Ground that looked at uh, campus <coughs> uh, sexual assault across the country and um, efforts there to bring that uh, situation under better control. And finally, uh, on April 29th, we participated with one of our uh, significant partners, Cal Casa, uh, along with legislators and other policymakers on Denim Day at the state capitol. So as we look forward, um, reminding you that this is our 50th um, year of providing victim compensation uh, to California victims of crime. We are um, in the process of preparing for the Crime Victim Services Summit, which will be held in San Diego on November 3rd. We have sent um, Save the Date requests uh, to your offices so that uh, hopefully you can calendar that and participate with us, and I will have uh, more information about that in the coming months. Uh, that concludes my report. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, no, it was a busy month, and I do um, thank you and really appreciate the tour that the district attorney gave us in That's Alameda. Excellent. That was just very, very helpful, and she um, is pretty extraordinary in all that she's doing to assist victims. Yes, she is. Thank yep. you. Okay. Um, item number four is the contract report. And Julie, I think yes. you're going to read us Members, on that as well. um, as we come to uh, almost the close of the fiscal year, I'm bringing you several um, contracts um, and amendments there too. Uh, the first one is for Leading Resources, Inc., in the amount of $68,900. And this is a contractor that is assisting the board in the development of a new long-term uh, strategic plan and implementation plan. It's been a number of years since our uh, plan has been updated, um, and we are um, have begun the, the work on this. Um, and the staff is actively involved, and I'm very pleased that um, so many of our staff have uh, chosen to accept the invitation to participate in the development of our strategic plan. Excellent. So that's uh, the first one. Um, uh, let me go through them all, and then uh, we can probably just take one, uh, one motion on the entire report. Okay. Uh, the second one is an amendment for continuity consulting, uh, and the... Uh, amended amount is for $49,050, and, um, and the awards will be made uh, at the June meeting, and if timing doesn't work out, I will be asking you for delegation at the June meeting to be able to enter into the uh, award and contracting, uh, given that we will not be meeting in uh, July, which is our normal schedule. So the first is for um, our CARES modification project. Uh, this is a contract and uh, estimated amount of $1.1 million for the testing component of the um, modification project. Uh, I think, as you know, we have been working extremely closely in consultation with Caltech. Uh, they are completely on board with the approach uh, we are taking. Um, and this will uh, complete a very significant uh, portion of the uh, modification project. And the last is uh, also an anticipated uh, solicitation for what we're calling e-learning. Mm -hmm. uh, this too is being done in conjunction with our OVC um, uh, grant to reach um, and develop strategies to reach underserved populations. The estimated amount is 100,000 to 250,000. Um, and the contract will run until June of 2016. Uh, this will also help us implement online training courses, which is one of the strategies that we identified in the first year of our three-year work with OVC. So that's the um, full report. So you have um, a new contract, you have amendment, and notification of two solicitations. So I'd ask your approval Great. of those. Okay. Thank Thank approval of the contract item. Okay, I second that. It's been moved and seconded to approve the contract items, item number four on the agenda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. That item has been approved. Thank okay, you. we're moving on now to item number five, which is the legislative report. Wayne, I think you have that for us. I do. Uh, the, uh, in, in your binder is a summary of all the bills that involve our board. 
Uh, a couple updates uh, are uh, AB 1140, uh, carried by uh, Assemblyman Bonta, is now on the suspense file with the Assembly Appropriations Committee. The SB 518, 519, and uh, are both on the suspense file for the Senate Appropriations Committee, and SB 556 is now on the Senate floor. Our government uh, claims bill, AB 165, is scheduled to be heard in Senate Appropriations next week. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer. A lot of activity. There is. It's time of year. Um, I have no questions. Rick, do you have any? Okay, thank you, Wayne. Um, then we're going to go on now to item number six, which is a consideration of the nonprofit organization application for the 2015 Our Promise California State Employees Giving at Work that we will that will be presented by Ann Gordon. Hi, Ann. Good morning, Chairwoman Batcher and Board Member Shavaro. Thank you for letting me speak. I'm Ann Gordon with the Public Affairs uh, Office. As a brief reminder, the Charitable State Employees Giving at Work, which is now known as Our Promise, uh, was established in 1957 and provides a single coordinated fundraising drive that allows state employees to direct regular contributions from their paychecks to any of thousands of participating charitable organizations. I would think, like Andy, would you like to introduce yourself? Good morning, Secretary Batcher, uh, Mrs. Nauman, the um, other member of the board that's here today, and, and the public. My name is Andy Sheehy. I'm the Executive Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer for our local United Way here in uh, Sacramento, California Capital Region. Um, I have with me um, uh, Leslie Ortiz, who is the new director of our Promise State Employees Giving at Work campaign. Um, so you'll be seeing um, a lot of her as well as your staff. And um, we would like to thank you again for um, this second year of our deepened relationship as we uh, manage the certification process. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's gone very well. Uh, nonprofits all across the country continually see state employees as a great place um, to have an audience with um, for contributions. This last year we raised over six and a half million dollars across the state from state employees. Um, Met the goal as I remember. That, that is yeah. correct. That's correct. Um, and so the relationship between um, our organization and, and yours under the leadership of um, Mrs. Nauman um, continues to, to be strengthened. And as this does, uh, as our relationship uh, strengthens and, and we work more closely with the staff, um, we're hopeful and, uh, and we've had some discussions on how we can, when we have shared visions that, that align with each other, um, how we can deepen our relationship um, and leverage that for, for, um, for a greater purpose in addition to raising money for nonprofits. So it's a great example of a good public-private partnership. Well, you've done a great job, and the rebranding is, I think, going well as well. So. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. And did you have anything further? Uh, well, I just wanted to um, mention the purpose of this board action item uh -huh. is to go ahead and obtain the board's approval for the 2,645 applications that we have reviewed and deemed um, complete for approval into the Our Promise campaign for the upcoming year. Okay, great. Is there anyone besides those that have already addressed the board who would like to address the board on this item? Any further? Okay, it's I second. It's been moved and approved to accept the staff recommendation on this item. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. It's been approved. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. Okay, we'll now move to the government claims program. The next item on the agenda is the government claims program consent agenda that will be presented by Nicholas Wagner, government claims program manager. Good morning, Mr. Wagner. Good morning. Before I speak, I believe Chief Counsel Wayne Stumfer has some comments about the program he would like to yes, make. Yes, I have asked him to, um, I, and, and I, I guess this is a good time to also just say for you all who are following the, the uh, agenda that uh, the claim of Mr. Justin Carter, um, his representative, has come to us this morning and asked his claim to be moved um, to next month's agenda, and we will be doing that. So, um, Wayne, would you please um, outline the roles and the responsibilities of the board as it 
uh, relates to government claims. Uh, yes, Chairman. The government claims program is an administrative remedy for claims against government entities. When we can, we facilitate resolutions between claimants and departments. Many claims involve complex issues of fact and law, often needing presentation of multiple witnesses, expert testimony, and real evidence. In these cases, the Board denies the claim because of its complexity, because the Board is not equipped to hear such evidence that sometimes can take days or weeks to present. The claim is better suited for a court where there is a judge and a jury. When the Board denies a claim due to the complexity, it is not a ruling on the merits. It isn't saying that there is or is not a case. It is simply saying that the claimant should be best served by going to court and that the, claim, the court, or I'm sorry, the claimant will have a right to go to court with their claim. That's a helpful uh, reminder to us all. Okay, um, Mr. Wagner. Good morning, Chairperson Batcher and Board Member Shavaro. For the record, I'm Nicholas Wagner and I will present the Government Claims Program agenda items. Item seven is the Government Claims Consent Agenda. It consists of 446 claims. Before the board takes action on the consent agenda, item 59 is previously mentioned for Justin Carter, and item 91 for Richard Stevens, and item 408 for James Quillacy have been removed so that the claimants may address the board in August. Additionally, item 113 for Barbara Singh has been removed so that the claimant may address the board today with the exception of the removed claims, staff requests that the board approve the consent agenda. Okay, thank you, Mr. Wagner. Do I have a motion to accept uh, the items as just outlined by Mr. Wagner? So moved. On the consent, and it has been seconded. All in favor of accepting the consent uh, agenda? Aye. Aye. Thank you, Mr. Wagner. Thank you. Item 113 is the claim of Barbara Sang. Ms. Sang claims damages from the California Department of Public Health in an amount exceeding $25,000 for discrimination and retaliation. Program staff recommends the claim be rejected because it raises complex issue of fact and law beyond the scope of analysis and interpretation typically undertaken by the board. Representing herself today is Ms. Sang, and representing the Department of Public Health is Linda Williams. And is the Department of Public Health here today? Yes. Okay, thank you. Ms. Sang, would you like to um, come to the table and restate your name? And may I please have the representative from Department of Public Health also come to the table? I am Barbara saying what I am placing up here I want to keep up here for people to see is that when I reported racism this is the direction are the directions that I was given in an official investigative interview that the late um, the human resources branch chief typed drop it let it go don't keep looking for examples to let us know don't keep regurgitating and she even typed that I reported racism in that too. And keep in mind, that was an official investigative interview, and these are the directions I was given. And they started on with their investigation, but waited until near the statute of limitations for me to file charges with the EEOC before they chose to you know, interview the people they wanted to interview. They failed to interview key witnesses, including um, Carol Arbuckle. And I think because of my PTSD, I would like to, um, you know, in initially speak off what I wrote, please. Mm -hmm. um, it feels very important for me to um, be here because I think it's important to have a voice in what I have recognized in CDPH, um, which is really, I think, um, endemic in that de department, and it covers a lot of different issues, including with what happened with the nursing home complaints. They just drop it, and they just wait for lawsuits. Well, you know, lawsuits don't 
affect the critically needed changes. You, you know, people are hurt. You lose valuable employees. Um, people around you start knowing that unlawful and unethical behavior um, is, is this acceptable, and th things disintegrate, and um, you know, harmful a harmful workplace and culture um, develops. And here, I also like to keep displayed about the Whistleblower Protection Act. Um, it's a very important act, but the fact is, it's not safe to whistleblow at all. And you know, you can watch the YouTube video about Kathleen Carroll reporting about what happened to her at the, the commission. My friend Janine Carter was a whistleblower. Carol Arbuckle experienced three hostile work environments. Um, and I'll begin re um, reading now. Um, excuse me, I, I wanted to introduce myself in person. Barbara Sang. Thank you. Okay. I spoke earlier about whistleblowing and the importance of ethical behavior. Carol Arbuckle is one of my witnesses for what I experienced in CDPH, and she sought to protect me and others in 2010 from what we were experiencing from our HR supervisor. One of the specialists, um, AWALD, in October 2010, but she had um, started suffering in 2008, which was when Carol urged her to keep a log of the supervisor's mistreatment of her. <sighs> Carol reported to an HR manager in July 2010 that HR has a hostile work environment right after she learned of her winning verdict for her whistleblower lawsuit. She came into work you know, before she officially returned to work, and everybody had heard of her, um, her, her verdict. They were you know, curious. They were excited for her. Um, it went around the office. That day, she let an HR manager know that during her trial, she realized that HR has a hostile work environment. I actually wrote one of my friends, a friend in Belgium, about Carol telling that manager that in July 2010, a record that I sent to EEOC in 2013. Carol recognized by October 2010 that she was beginning to experience ostracism and reprisals for her efforts to protect me and others. By November 2010, the harassment became so relentless that her former supervisor urged her to copy or blind copy Sandy Cornwell on her emails. And um, Carol um, forwarded me um, that email, which I sent to EEOC. She also overheard her age being discussed and it being said that she was too old and should retire. She was an incredibly hard worker. She had an extraordinary um, work ethic. She used to have her own business. She knew the importance of a culture. I wish you to keep in mind that this was all happening in a re human resources office in a large department, the Department of Public Health. As I stated, she had already experienced two other hostile work environments. What she experienced at CDPH was the third time it was my first time. I had worked in that human resources office since 1996. You know, keep in mind that CDPH was formed in 2007 in, in July when um, health services split into two departments. Sandy Cornwell actually interviewed me and hired me, and I became a multiple award winning specialist. I want you to keep in mind, too, that I have to make a very big decision. About, just give me a moment. Take a moment. Thanks. Um, whether or not to sue. And I currently did, did file, um, I did hire a workers' comp law firm, which will give me valuable self knowledge. Because I've interviewed a number of lawyers. And above, also I have, you know, my husband has a good friend who's a business litigator, a partner in a Los Angeles law firm. And all lawyers have warned me that I'll be further traumatized. It, um, therapists have warned me, you know, you really can't heal to after it. But, my thanks. <laughs> but my ethics tell me I should sue. I want you to keep in mind, Carol's whistleblower lawsuit cost the state of California millions of dollars. 
She got almost $3 million. Her lawyer got around a million. But that doesn't factor in the cost to the state of the appeals, the depositions, everything else. Her whistleblower lawsuit cost the state of California millions. And it all ha unfolded for Carol because of experiences that never should have happened to her when she was working for that board. And it all unfolded because a chairwoman did not want to take accountability for um, you know, um, letting her license lapse. The fine she would have had to pay, my research found, would have been $1,000 to $5,000. Ms. And so I don't want to interrupt you because okay. I know this is a very uh, okay, difficult I'll, I'll moment, but I, I really want to learn my case. about your case. Okay? <laughs> I understand. That would be but, helpful. But, but it's really, maybe maybe what, it would yeah. be helpful if you just stick to your statement. Okay, but what's really, I really want to emphasize the fact that about the crazy making and about how important accountability is. No, I, I, and, and this, I understand the situation that. And I think really you've painted that picture. Uh, thank but I you. think okay. it's important to okay. stick to your, okay. your case. All right. I report, like, as I said, I reported racism in an official investigative interview, which her HR branch chief, um, Sandy Cornwall, typed. She also typed the then labor relations officer directed me to drop it and to not keep looking for examples to let them know. She even typed him offensive direction to me to not keep regurgitating. Keep in mind an official investigative interview. Um, back in that t terrible year, you know, my pleas for a new supervisor were all um, rejected. I was told I could not run away. I was told to look for another job if I was unhappy. And I was threatened in October 2010, which effectively achieved my silence. <laughs> Just take a couple deep breaths. But what's, what was so effective about that threat? Huh. I fully transformed into an abuse victim with all of the psychology. And their investigation, for which they failed to interview key witnesses, found I was never mistreated, not even once, and the verified experience of my HR supervisor arriving at my cubicle and announcing that she had to come down to the um, ghetto could, only could be considered inappropriate and unprofessional, and not that it is. And it wasn't even found to be, um, I didn't even experience one violation of the Dignity Clause. Keep in mind, a specialist, AWOL, giving up her benefits, giving up her future retirement benefits, AWOL, and she, she and I weren't the only ones that had suffered. That supervisor had a long list of other victims, which, you know, one I was told, and I was also learned that, you know, months after I had my breakdown at work, Again, when, when, you're, when I'm speaking, please keep in mind that Sandy Cornwell hired me in 1996. I had, have an extraordinary work ethic. I w earned awards. And there's supposed to be policies and laws and harassment supposed to be investigated. Well, the fact is that t a two HR analysts whose job ad for their position states they are considered expert advisors and consultants to managers about employment laws and conduct, witnessed several incidents and reported it to HR management, and I never knew. My HR management didn't even bother, you know, to come to me to see if I was okay. And one of those analysts let me know that months after I had my breakdown at work, she even witnessed with the other analysts that break down at work after the final of the two incidents where it was just wailing at work and they were there. And she witnessed my HR supervisor standing outside my cubicle and that supervisor was smirking. I am having a breakdown.
And yet, drop it. Let it go. Don't keep regurgitating. Don't keep looking for examples. I'm not the only one who suffered. And believe me, I suffered. <sighs> Reports of harassment and discrimination are required to be acted on. In September 2010, I emailed my friend in Belgium about Desiree experiencing racism. I was even begging for a new supervisor via email, you know, one of which, I think I sent mo um, EOC, most of them, and EOC, the senior investigator, in March 2012, read an expert of them. And by the way, that experience with EEOC, I didn't know what to expect, you know. And I thought I'd just, you know, give him my, my claim form and it would be accepted. And instead, he told me that he couldn't accept it just based on the, the, the ghetto incident, that he had to make sure there was support for it. So what I did, I gave him the, pretty much the similar, the very same timeline that I had, was offering to Sandy Cornwell and Ray Kelly in November 2011, and Sandy Cornwell rejected my offer to provide a timeline in advance. What does that say about their interest in really having a thorough investigation? I, w I went to that investigative interview in December 2011. With they, you know, they didn't have you know hardly any information from from me, and then I'm still told you know drop it, don't keep looking for examples to let them know. And I brought the timeline as a as a memory jog, and she demanded to make a copy of it afterwards. But even, even so, EEOC, Mr. Shear you know, told me he couldn't accept it until he saw support, and, you know, thank God I brought the timeline. Is I, your you know, case still before EEOC? Yeah, th that's another thing you, the state needs to know. Last year in the spring, I think it was in March, I was told EEOC in Oakland, four investigators, they were down the four investigators, and I was so disappointed that the senior EEOC investigator, who I talked to a number of times until... I had a major PTSD episode on, um, on a phone call for, with him, um, but he'd left at the beginning of last year. Four investigators, and I was told that they were hiring more and they needed to be trained. Um, Dave Patel, we experienced something we shouldn't have experienced from the same manager. He actually um, escalated his by contacting um, Senator Barbara Boxer's office, and they got his mo moved way up. Um, and then he even forwarded so, me. So your case still is before EEOC? Yes. Okay. I mean, I saw I your just, letter that indicated from last contact. It's still I'm open. I'm sorry, but we really need to kind of be focused, okay? okay? okay. I know this is very difficult for you, and it I appreciate very, that. It's very difficult. Okay. Um, all right. So, you know, I suffered for over a year in the spring of 2012. So my final incidents were in May 2011. A psychologist diagnosed my PTSD and informed me that my mind... that my mind was disassociating to cope with all the abuse at work. I have a wonderful marriage, thank God, but he's had PTSD for a life since 2010. And one thing he described to me when he had me telling him some of the um, experiences, he said it was like I was an a in a, had been in a car crash, was in an ambulance on the way to the hospital, and then the ambulance crashes. Just keeps happening over and over, so I just had no time to recover. I even seen my, saw my emails where I was writing, I felt so fractured. My, you know, my supervisor's mistreatment of me is bizarre. Over and over, that kind of thing. And I'm writing a friend in Belgium in September 2010, Desiree is experiencing racism, and, and I'm just trapped because I foolishly clung to that job. What I was thinking, I don't know. Let's I um, try and get to a summary if we sure. can. <sighs> okay. I experienced and saw a lot of crazy making in CDPH. The findings letter identifies that HR Annette Mendoza manager admitted I reported numerous complaints. It's right in the findings letter. I reported numerous complaints. And right in the findings letter is all she did was give my supervisor advice. And then she con contradicts herself. It's in the findings letter too. That my stress was not work related, it was personal. 
I mean, keep in mind, two analysts were even reporting incidents that I never knew. They worked on the other side of the cubicle wall, wall from me. Carol Arbuckle was actively in hey, to protect I understand. me. Okay. Um, and then in, in one month before um, I got put in that supervisor's um, unit, you know, on my March IDP, the former supervisor, Alicia, wrote, I'm a great asset in HRB. Keep in mind, I'd worked there in 1996, multiple awards. Um, and look at how CDPH treats assets. And how CDPH treats assets, too. Um, I, was, I requested a copy of, you know, um, logs. Um, this shows, you know, you know, harassment claims. I mean, you, could you kind of barely read them. Um, and, you know, harassment claims, and yet CDPH didn't even bother to make sure that there was compliance with uh, um, the um, preventing harassment, you know, sexual harassment, workplace harassment training that's legally required for supervisors and managers every two years. It was huge. And God had me becoming then a training coordinator in my next job in CDPH, where I had access to see so much and had training coordinators telling me about huge noncompliance in their program, too. In my program in 2012, two-thirds of the supervisors and managers were not compliant. I even got through a Public Records Act request, which through my research I found that even citizens have a right to do. Um, I even got um, Director um, Ron Chapman's um, you know, mandated training record. He just took his information privacy security training, didn't bother to take his, um, you know, the sexual harassment training at, at all either, or any of the others, including the, um, the two um, disaster trainings. Ms. Zhang, if I may, um, just because I, I, I want to get to understand. some specific, but no, no okay. I have a question for you. Oh, sure. <sighs> when you filed with EEOC, what did, what, what was your filing? I, I'm for um, um for um sexual harassment no ra racial dis uh, racial discrimination and um, retaliation okay Thank yeah you. all right if you can just um, um I know sure. it's difficult but if you can just summarize now that would be okay. very helpful and so um the crazy making includes you know executive management condoning illegally the long term non compliance of even the legally required mandated training. Uh, in seven, in the se July 1st, 2014, training coordinators meeting, it was announced only 20% out of almost 4,000 are compliant. Thousands of employees out of compliance. Going back to 2012, I was alerting then acting OCR chief, acting internal audits chief, Jean, I always mispronounce her name, I Iziano? Yes, you know. Sino and Chief Deputy Director Daniel Kim about the non-compliance of the harassment training, and I even stated in my email to them that I was in contact with the EOC senior investigator. And I had copied also the OCR investigator, Kathy O'Neill, on it, and she wrote me back, my emails are being read. Well, I kept, you know, I kept, you know, reporting about the noncompliance, and then I became officially a whistleblower the following year. And I even wrote the director, Ms. Asiano, and Mr. Kim, I'm a whistleblower, reckless indifference, and still the noncompliance continued. Crazy making, and and I my research found that there are employees before me and after me who had filed charges, you know, with EOC. But you, the important point to keep in mind too, I think most employees, and in fact, and one, you know, manager even told me this. We'll just go. We'll just leave. You know, they. You know, they won't do anything. And and I think a very rare percentage will even file a lawsuit. So yes, I understand, Mr. Strumpner, about you know rejection of claims and you know giving the right to to a lawsuit and all that. But lawsuits don't don't affect the critically needed changes. And Carol Arbuckle's lawsuit, you know, took you know over a decade of her life, and she just got you know her judgment la last last year. But right, but it's what very could, difficult. What, but that's right. the system. And know, one of the is, points that was. There's that There's the general counsel was going to Would make you, was right. that the complexity of cases are much, we are not a body that can yeah. deal with those. It's not under our roles and responsibilities. It is indeed the role of the court. But So I must ask you to please summarize. Sure. summarize. And, and again, I wanted to emphasize about the ethical and finish, unlawful and behavior. Pardon? If you could Pardon? just summarize. Oh, sure. Um, I, I wanted to point out, too, um, the um, Ms. Williams sent a letter to me that she had sent to uh, Mr. Wagner early yesterday, and um, she sent it to me um, after 6 um, last night. And um, the letter is full of inaccuracies and also leaves out some investigations, the, my four complaints against the CDPH 1007s against the four HR managers, and also my retirement dates are wrong in there and all that. So I just wanted to, you know, to point out that. And Sandy Cornwell and Ray Kelly did not do a workplace violence investigation. Man, um, they did a CDPH 107. 
Okay, um, and then, um, let's see. Um, and so, yeah. In CDPH, I was a whistleblower internally, externally, and you have to keep in mind, too, regarding that harassment training, it would have helped my case if I didn't open my mouth and say, I, you know, Ma'am, we, we, we talked okay. about the training and the lack okay. thereof, so let's just keep going and let's summarize, okay. summarize because I don't want to cut you off, but I'm going to have to sure. if you don't summarize. Okay. Dropping it is what they have done, and that is wrong, and accountability needs to occur. And I'm aware of SBB 413, and I had even emailed SBB and the state auditor about that too, where the department's not having appropriate actions, and you know the state personnel board, you know, can do, you know, demand to know why, and then and then has the authority then to proceed with those actions. So another thing I have to point out too, because it is very critical, is that Carol Arbuckle over and over and via email was reporting discrimination to HR management, and she was threatening to file charges in November and December of 2011, days before this investigation, when I'm told to drop it and not keep looking for examples no, to let them know. No, we need to concentrate on your case, okay? But, but, it, but it's very relevant. It, you know, you, you report harassment, Under, you report I understand your discrimination, the atmosphere and the drop, environment in which you're talking it, about. Yeah. All, right, all right, you have literally a minute to finish, please. Okay. I've asked you before, and yeah, I, no, I, I don't want to, I, I really, we need to move, yeah. move so, on to a summation. Yeah, so my sum, summation is some outside entity needs to create safety in that department. Because I think that department is incapable of doing it on their own. They even blatantly are violating laws. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it very much, and, and I know this is difficult. All right, I'm now going um, to turn to um, Miss Williams, I believe your name yes. is. Yes. I'm sorry, I should have asked you to state your name earlier. If you could state your name and your position, I would appreciate it for the record. Linda Williams, I'm the Senior Counsel in the Office of Legal Services, the California Department of Public Health. Um, could you please make your statement? Uh, I'm not sure that I would qualify it as a statement. Um, I'm hoping to rest the department's representation at this particular meeting on the letter that I gave to Mr. Wagner. I uh, and I and if you don't have a copy, uh, I, I we don't have a copy of the no. letter. And in in when you delivered it last evening at 6 p.m. to me. Oh. But it has it's full of errors. It yeah, I, I know. We we went through that. Um, we don't have a copy. I, I'd be happy to read it into the record then. I don't the, the difficult the difficulty we will have is we're going to start debating the facts of the letter, and I don't think this is the right form in which to do that. There very may well be errors in it, but this again is not the place to. We haven't read the letter. I haven't seen the letter. The general counsel, the executive officer, is not. Um, Ms. Zhang says there are errors in it. So I, I don't think this is the right form. For and that. I would like to ask because Ms. Williams did email me um, last week that she'd be providing me material five days in advance of you know this um, this meeting today. And again, I got the copy of the letter, which she actually um, sent to you know Nick, you know um, you know hours okay. earlier. Um, so I, Williams, I don't know why everything's at the last minute. I have a couple minute. questions for you. Certainly, Excuse me, Ms. Zhang. I, I now would like to to talk to. Um, Ms. Williams and, and Rick, if you have any questions as well. Um, can you uh, address whether or not um, uh, CDPH actually did an investigation? And if they did an investigation, under what circumstances did you do one? Because under FIHA, of course, you are obligated. In the uh, Office of Labor Relations. Was the um, body prevention program, 
And so if something came in as a complaint of hostile work environment, it was investigated essentially as a workplace violence This, this is inaccurate because in November 2011, um, um, HR Branch T, Sandy Cornwell, stopped health and safety officers from th investigating. This is really not the, the okay. this body doesn't have this but kind I, but of I'm concerned about I understand this is why being, when we talk about okay. the complexities of this case, it is very complex. And we are not a, a we are not the superior court. Right. So right. please, Miss Williams and I both allowed you, and rightfully so, to speak. It is now Miss Williams' um, turn, okay. and I've asked her a couple questions. So continue, please. Uh, so that is how the complaint came. Whether or not that was the so intention, the, that's that. That's how the complaint came. So restate that it it it's, it was investigated as a as a violent a workplace violence prevention investigation because the keywords used were hostile work environment. At the time, those that term was defined in our IIPP policy uh, as um, the department has a responsibility to uh, prevent workers from feeling they are in a hostile work environment. So uh, based on that, it was given to the Chief of our Office of Labor Relations at the time, Ray Kelly, and he conducted an investigation under that authority. Um, a report was issued uh, on July 6, 2012, and Ms. Seng, uh, it was actually addressed to Ms. Seng, and she was given a copy. Um, and it's a, a several page- uh, Nine pages. Report. Um, in reporting the um, individuals who had been interviewed and the findings. Rick, do you have any questions? No, I don't. Um, Mr. Wagner, anything further? I have nothing more to add. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'll move staff recommendations. I second staff recommendations. It's been moved and seconded to accept stack staff recommendations on this case. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. I appreciate your, your time and Thank your effort. Thank you. Very, very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Tommy. Okay, we are now moving on to item number eight. Um, I'll give you time to collect your things. I do want to say one thing. It's very hard being here. I know, and I appreciate that. I, I, I know it is. It's very hard, and it's very emotional, and I thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Okay. Um, Nick, would you please brief us on item number eight? Item eight is one request by a state agency for discharge from accountability for collection of debt totaling $48,804,757.80. Program staff request that the board approve this application. Move approval. And seconded to approve staff recommendation on the discharge from accountability for collection on number Is the government claim program portion of our meeting, and we will now move to the victim's compensation program portion of our agenda. The next item is the proposal to approve the Trauma Recovery Center Grant Awards. That will be presented by Robin Fimo. I'm sorry, I'm destroying I know, your name right. with my voice. It's <laughs> okay. Femmelby. So, Robin, yes. welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning, board members. I'm Robin Femmelby, manager of the resource branch with CalVCP. Today, I'm presenting the board item requesting approval on the proposal to approve three Trauma Recovery Center grant awards for fiscal year 2015-16 funding. Based on the applicant's response to the notice of funds available and careful evaluation by staff, today three trauma recovery centers are being recommended. The recommendation is in the amount of $2 million, which is the appropriation for the fiscal year. The first trauma recovery center is the Children Nurturing Project in Solano County. <coughs> the second is Father and Families of San Joaquin and San, jo uh, of San, Joaquin, and San Joaquin 
sorry, county, which is in Stockton. And special, it's a mouthful, isn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and special services for groups, which is in Los Angeles County. This would be continuation of funding for the special services group and establish two new TRCs in Northern California. Today we have many representatives from the Trauma Recovery Centers present. Uh, we, from Fathers and Family of San Joaquin, we have Sammy Nunez, Andrian, Adriano Rontal, Tariq Mohammed, Alejandra Gutierrez, and uh, Jackie Coulter, who she's with the San Joaquin County Behavioral Health Services, who is a partner with uh, Fathers and Family of San Joaquin. We also have the Children Nurturing Project. We have Lori um, Andres, Andres and Debbie Davis. And from Special Services for Groups, we have Jennifer Young and Veronica Lewis. Great. Everybody give me a wave so I know you're here. <laughs> Yay. Hi. Welcome. <laughs> Okay. And that was it. That's so we're, just, it. Yeah, we're seeking your approval, please. All right. Approval. approval. <laughs> um, it's and it's been moved and I second. It's been moved and seconded to approve uh, the uh, uh, trauma recovery center grant awards. Um, are there is there any discussion? I should ask that since there are so many of you here today. Okay. Seeing none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much, Robin, and thank you, all of you, for all the wonderful work you do. It's, it's really quite unbelievable when we visit the trauma centers and see um, the hard, emotional, difficult, but great success and help you're providing your fellow citizens, so fellow Californians, so thank you. Okay, um, the board will now convene into closed session pursuant to government code section 11126C3 and E1 to discuss pending litigation and numbers 1 through uh, 71.